So let's go to Genesis chapter 21 as we continue on here uh, and just see what the Lord has for us this morning. Uh, it, it tells us this uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 uh, about Sarah. It says, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. So we see that Sarah had a faith also, as well as Abraham. It wasn't his faith she was depending on. It was the faith that the Lord had given her. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 21 here, that the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bear Abram a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. It's been 25 years <laughs> of them walking along. The promise had come. Uh, that's a long promise to wait for. Uh, but we've waited for one even longer, haven't we? we? We've waited for one of him coming to gr get the church and rapture us out of here and take us home to be with him forever. Uh, a, a long time coming, but one w that we look forward to. But isn't it amazing that as we look at this, we see that uh, we, we really don't have a problem with Sarah getting pregnant, even though she was 90 and, and Abraham was 100. But we do have a problem with Mary being able to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit to have a baby. There really is no issue. It's just an issue of trust. And we believe that God is able to do anything at any time for any purpose and it's just uh, we, we, we struggle with some of those sometimes thinking that, that God can't help us God can't lead us God can't continue to, to sustain us in, in the midst of all this and yet he is able he, he's the God who is able to do anything he's the God of the impossible uh, and, and they believed him they trusted him and, and to me it's it's just mind-blowing as it went through it this week just thinking how many things I haven't believed that God could do. God, I can't, I can't believe that you can get me through this trial. I can't believe that you can get me through this hard time. I can't believe that you can get me and, and sustain me uh, at, at our age. And yet he continues to. And we just are amazed at it. We're astonished that God is that powerful. God is that big. But in the midst of it, isn't he revealing to us and showing us that he is able and that he's going to continue that good work that he's begun. And it's been a good work. It's been a good work because he's taken us from death to life. It's been a good work because he's given us a hope where we had no hope. He's done a good work. He's taken us out of darkness and brought us into the light. We haven't needed alcohol or drugs to get through a day. All we needed was him. Oh, thank you, Lord. And he didn't even charge us for it. The drug dealers on the corner keep charging the bars keep charging. He hasn't charged you one thing. He just wants your heart. <laughs> and as we get his heart, we start trusting him more and more, and we start walking in those ways that, that bring hope to us, that bring life to us. And, and we just all we can do is just stand in amazement at his glory and just worship him. Uh, keep, keep on looking at him. Keep on trusting him because he's the one that's able. <clears throat> And Abraham, in verse 3, called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare unto him, Isaac, uh, which the Lord told him before, that's going to be his name. His name means laughter. Uh, as they rejoice in this, as they get ministered to in the midst of this, can you imagine looking at this young one every day and, and just realizing what God has done, realizing the beauty of birth, the, the wonder, the amazement of it, especially at an age that they're at realizing that it was a gift of, from God to them, just as Jesus' birth and death and resurrection is a gift of God to us from him. Ugh. And Abram circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, the, the, the practice that God had given to Abram uh, to show him uh, that they were separate from the things of the world. Uh, God commanded him to do that, and Abram was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. 
I, I can't imagine starting out with a toddler at 100 years old. <laughs> we had a family picnic yesterday because our grandson's up from Florida. Uh, and boy, they wore me out within minutes. I was worn out before we even started. It's just <laughs> and then all these people showed up. It's just amazing. But at 100 years old, starting out being a dad. Oh, you want to run, Dad? No. <laughs> I'll shuffle. You run. <laughs> I got my walker. We're all set. We can go now. It's motorized. Uh, Abram was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born unto him, and Sarah said, God had made me to laugh so that all here, all that here will laugh with me. Uh, th those that are going to rejoice are going to rejoice with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abram that Sarah sh should I should have given children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age. Just so grateful for the things of the Lord, realizing what a blessing it was for Abram, what a blessing it was for her, uh, that, that she just included the whole family and just uh, blessed them all. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abram made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Uh, it says this in, in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verses 12 and 13. Uh, well, let's pick up at verse 11. Uh, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This time of weaning, this time of... Uh, coming away, just separation now between mother and son, mother and child, uh, which could go from anywhere from uh, a year to three or four years, usually about three or four years old uh, in those days. Uh, and then they would wean, there would be a party, uh, they would celebrate that he had now come uh, through the first section of his age, of his group, of his life. Uh, but he's come to a new time in life. And isn't that just like what the Lord does with you and I? He brings us to that place. And the reason I went to Hebrews for that is because so many in the church just want Jesus for salvation, and they leave it there. And they don't go any further. They stay on the battle for the rest of their lives. And oh, how important it is for us to get into the Word to, to use the word, to be able to be skillful, like the like Hebrew says, to be skillful in the use of the word. Remember when we first got saved, started going to church, uh, and really didn't do much with the Bible. First five years was just kind of listening to the pastor at the church and, and just growing. And all of a sudden, the Lord just really knocked me for a loop. And I, and I started reading. You know, there's all kinds of stuff in here. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and the Lord started showing me, you need to be in the Word. You, you don't want Him to feed you. I want to feed you. And that's the relationship that a father with a son should be, is that He wants to feed us. We can certainly be fed while we're here and go through those things and have things explained and, and have understanding come to us. But isn't it more wonderful when your Father in Heaven speaks to you and ministers to you and opens the Word to you? And shows you the deeper things, shows you the, the things that he has for your life. Because I don't know what you need in your life right now, but he does. And he's able to open the word in that place that you need so that you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of who he is. And he's the only one that can know that. He knows the depths of your heart better than I'll ever know. And so at this party, when this separation comes and, and he starts growing in those things, as they start seeing him grow and, and develop, they want him to become one who's able to be skillful in life, to know the skills of life. They start teaching him, maybe tent making, how to take care of the, the, the herds and the cows and the, the, uh, all the, the groups of 
uh, animals that they have to know when to leave, to know where there's water, to know all those things to become skillful in life, which is what we want our kids to do. Because there's nothing worse, well, there is, but there's nothing worse than the kids staying at home uh, and never knowing anything, and you're doing everything for them at 40, just as much as you did when they were 20, just as much as you did when they were five, just as much as you did when they were just born. It's hard on the whole family that way, but how wonderful it is when they can grow up with life skills where they can go out and get their own job and do their own things and move out, and then you close the doors and throw away the key and they don't come back, <laughs> except when the grandkids come, and then you, they can bring those. But but we need to grow in that, that skillfulness of just realizing the, these life skills that we need to have. And part of those life skills for Christians is knowing how to read the Word of God and knowing what to do with the Word of God. And you don't know that without, without a relationship with your Father in Heaven as He teaches you and ministers to you every day as you read out of His Word. And He shows you uh, those things. He shows you your heart. Uh, I, I got lasted this week uh, I was reading one of the old pastors uh, and he was saying that uh, he was going to a conference uh, and he asked for the Holy Spirit to anoint him to use him and he's driving from where he was to to the conference it was a, a few hour drive so he had some time so he was just asking the Lord to anoint him to use him and the Lord said why and he goes because I, I I want these guys to get blessed. And he goes, no, you want these guys to know that you can teach the word. Why don't you ask me that every day when you minister to your kids? Why don't you ask me that every day when you get up out of bed so you can minister to everybody that you meet during the day? Why is it just special conferences that you ask me to anoint you for? And it's just like, oh, because here I am praying on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Lord, please anoint me. Use me. <laughs> and he says, why? Because <laughs> you want to be seen or because you want me to be known? Oh, and that goes really to the depths that, that nobody else can take us to. Those are the depths that only the Lord can take us to and show us where our hearts really are. We think we're, we're praying this, these religious prayers that are doing wonders. <laughs> and he says, you're just doing them for yourself. I want to work through you. I certainly want to work in you, but I want to work through you. So help me with it, Lord. Oh, and as you come to those places, you just realize wh why some of the things that we do, we do. You know, why are we doing them? And he says, I want you to do them because you love me. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abram made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. That celebration, that going from milk to meat now, and, and just growing in that grace. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abram. So we've got a bunch of years that have gone by. We've, we've just gone through a few verses, but it's really probably three, four, five years that we've gone through just in these few verses. Uh, and we see the, the time frame just flying by for these people. Sarah sees the son of Hagar. She sees Ishmael, which she had born unto Abram. And he was mocking. He was, he was laughing, but not with her. He was laughing at her. He was laughing at this child. Laughing, which is what sin does. There's a representation here, and we're going to go to Galatians in a bit and, and just see what that is. Uh, but boy, it's, it's a place where we, if we realize what's really happening, it, it takes on a new importance for us and into us. This Ishmael, which is uh, just a picture of the flesh, was just mocking the things of the Spirit. And isn't that always the case, that the works of the flesh always mock the works of the Spirit? The works of the flesh will always mock Christianity, will always mock the work of Jesus on the cross, will always mock your Bible. And if you want a new Bible, AI is coming, and they promise to write a new Bible, which will be really friendly for you, which will be really good. It won't tell you the truth, but <laughs> it'll give you something. Be careful of what you're reading and how you're reading it and where it comes from. <laughs> oh, boy, because the enemy is always going to mock. And wherefore, she said to Abram, as she sees Ishmael mocking, she looks to Abram and, and she says, Cast out this bondwoman 
and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And, and we think, well, that's pretty selfish. <laughs> and we think we need to do something with that. But really what the Lord is showing them is what's right. Because sometimes we, we have to be firm in our stance of what we're going to accept and what we're going to have to let go of. The things that are going to have to go and the things that need to stay. And the thing was very grievous in, in Abram's sight because of his son. He's 13 years old. He, he's walked with him and taught him things for 13 years now. And yet he's mocking the things of God, mocking the ways of God. And God said to Abram, let it not be grievous in your sight. And we think, what a rotten God, what an awful God that you would do something like this to anybody. But there's a purpose. There's a picture here that we really need to see. He was going to take care of Ishmael and Hagar. It wasn't that he was just going to cast them off and let them go. He was going to take care of them. But they had to be separate from the, the work of the Spirit because the flesh and the Spirit cannot be together in union. It has to be separate. That's why the Lord tells us in the New Testament to come out from among them and be separate. We can't be like the world. This church cannot look like the world and take on the things of the world and still be called Christian and still be followers of Christ. We have to be different. He's called us to be different. And this is just that picture that's going on. The Lord says to, to, to Abram, Let it not be grievous in your sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman in all that Sarah has said unto you. Hearken to her voice. For in Isaac shall your seed be called. All those that are going to come to faith are going to come through this line. They're not going to come through the line of the flesh. They're going to come through the line of the spirit. Mm. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is your seed. And so Abram rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Whoa. Hard things. Sometimes God calls us to hard things, but they're only hard because of the things that we desire rather than the things that are of God. What Abraham was desiring was this work of the flesh had become close to him. He'd kept it for a long time. And I know some of you have come out from works of the flesh before you got saved, and it was hard to let go of some of those things. Hard to let go of the parties. Hard to let go of of the work of the flesh, enjoying the things of the flesh, and yet the things of the Spirit have to be separate from those ways. They can't be the same. We can't enter into them the same way. And the longer we keep it, the harder it is to let it go. You can't imagine letting go of a 13-year-old. And yet the picture is, how long have we kept some of our sin in our life? Has it been a couple of years? Has it been 40 years that we've kept some of these things? The attitudes? The work of the flesh, some of the things that we hang on to, how long have we held on to them? And he says, one day he's going to come to you and I and, and tell us to let go of those things. But Lord, I've had it all my life. And we do that, don't we? Well, I'm the way I am. God's just going to have to put up with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we are the way we are because we walked in the flesh and we build up those habits. <clears throat> And we say, God, you can't change me is really what we're saying when we say that, isn't it? God, this is the way I am. You're going to have to put up with me. What we're really saying is, God, I don't want you to change me. I don't want you to make me holy. I want to walk in the flesh like this. And isn't it strange, you know, when we used to get together and we tell off-color jokes and everybody would laugh and everybody would have a good laugh and now we hear them and we kind of cringe. I hope we cringe. But do we do that with everything that's a work of the flesh? Or are we still hanging on to some of those things saying, God, I really don't want you to change me. Ugh, the attitudes, the anger, the frustration, the bitterness that we hold on to. And we do that with people, don't we? God tells me to forgive you, so I'll forgive you, but I don't like you. Let's see, what doesn't match in there? <laughs> and, and we do that. We do that. We see people that, that we know and we get, and you just start cringing and you go, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love you because the Bible tells me I have to, but I don't like you. Guess who you're going to be near in heaven? 
they're going to have the room right next door to you, so get used to them. Because <laughs> here we come. Because all these things are in the depths of our heart. And God says, I want to change every part of you. I want to minister to every part of you to make you more like me. Because we are supposed to be image bearers of the God who saved us, the God who made us, the God who loves us. And we can't be image bearers if we don't look like him. <laughs> and isn't it strange with some of the churches that are out there that you look at them and they look just like the world. They've got the same attitudes, the same programs, the same definitions of things. And we go, what God are you serving? Mm. Oh. And then it really comes down to the nitty gritty, doesn't it? Lord, am I really serving you or am I serving my flesh? Oh. And so he sent her away in verse 14. Abraham being obedient to the things of the Lord and he rose up early. Uh, uh, amazing. When God had spoken to him and told him to do it, he got up early to do it. I'd put it off as long as I could, and yet he gets up early to do it. How quick are we when the Lord tells us something to get up quick and do it? Lord, you're telling me to get rid of the anger that's in my life. Do we get up early to do it? Do we rise up right away? Oh, or do we hang on to it for special occasions, like when you get on the expressway? <laughs> mm, Lord, help us. <laughs> He sent her away. She departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba, and the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down over against him a good way off, as if it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? Because remember just a few chapters ago, she was cast out once before. And evidently she forgot the one that took care of her because he provided for her there too and sent her back. And evidently she's forgotten because now she's in that place of just, we're all going to die. It's going to be over with. No, no good is going to come of this. Not remembering what God did for her already just a, just a little bit ago. And we do the same thing, don't we? We, we hit a trial. We hit a, a bump in the road. And we cry out, God, you don't love me anymore. And yet we look back and we see all the times that God has taken care of us all the way through our lives. We're forgetful people when new trials come. Instead of realizing those trials are there for us to remember what God has already done and to enter into trust of him even more. And that's one of the reasons we take communion. And we're going to do that again this morning. Because it just we want to be in that place where we remember what God has already done for us. And that if he's taken care of that... Can he take care of us right where we are right now? Can he take care of our family? Can he minister to them? Can he change us from the inside out and, and, and make us more like him? And the answer is always yes. Yes, you can, Lord. But the question then comes to us, are you going to be willing to let him do that? God, am I willing today to let you touch my life in a way that, that I haven't let you touch me before? Am I willing to let you touch that area of my heart that I've kept closed off to you? Oh, we need to come to those places. And if God has been good to us all the way along, he's going to be good to us now. Because God is always good. God is good all the time. Amen. <laughs> and God heard the voice of the lad. <laughs> In verse 17, God hears the voice of the lad. Notice it says that he heard the voice of the lad. Didn't say anything about her. <laughs> Because he's ministering now in a new way, in a different way. It doesn't mean he hated her. It just means that he was trying to pay attention now to, I, to Ishmael to minister to him. He's of age now. He's, he's 13 or older. He wants to minister to this young lad. He's ministered to Hagar. He's talked with her. Now it's time to minister to him. And yet we can get jealous over those things. Well, how come, how come you gave them gifts that I don't have? How come they can sing and I can't sing? Well, hey, we know, Michael. It's all right. <laughs> I'm one of those. My, my mother used to sing on the radio uh, a long time ago on, on HAM. Uh, they had her on a few times, and she made a couple of records, and uh, she had a great soprano voice. Uh, my dad and I... On the other hand, 
<laughs> when we went to church, you two go up to the balcony. <laughs> as far away as you can get. <laughs> Our voices were not the best in the world. And they haven't improved with age. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Something went somewhere, but I lost a voice. But, yeah. but God doesn't care. He, he, he hears the voice of this lad. And it doesn't matter how wonderful you sound, how good your prayer is. If you're just crying out, help, Lord, like Peter when he was drowning, God hears. It doesn't matter the quality of voice. He didn't say, O oh, Lord, helpeth me now as I drowneth. Pick me up out of the water. He doesn't say any of that. He just says, help, Lord. He goes to the basics, and it didn't matter how it sounded. What, what mattered was, where's your focus and who are you going to? Help, Lord. In, in the midst of this, in the depths of my heart, hear me. Hear my cry, Lord. And isn't it wonderful? It tells us in the Psalms that God inclines his ear to hear you. He listens to you. As a father listens to his little child and gets his ear right down near that little child's voice to just hear that. That's how he listens to you and I. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called out to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? (laughs) Uh, What's your issue? And we think, well, Lord, how about a little compassion here? I'm out in the wilderness, I'm under a bush, I'm trying to get some shade here. How about a little compassion? He said, what is wrong with your heart? Oh, and it wasn't that he was upset with her. He loved her, but he wanted her to realize, why are you in this position of crying out like this when I've taken care of you so well all the way along? What's ailing you and why aren't you remembering? Why aren't you trusting? And what does he say? Fear not. And he never says fear not in the scriptures without a purpose because she was afraid. He knows the depths of our heart. He knows she was afraid. He knows she was afraid of losing him and afraid of dying herself. And yet he comes to her and says, don't fear. It wasn't that he was mad at her. Why are you ailing? It's just, where is your heart? He always deals with the issues of the heart. He doesn't deal with the issues of the outward. He deals with the issues of the heart. Why are you fearing right now? There's a great story of Corrie Ten Boom, and she was uh, at one of the uh, Nazi death camps uh, during World War II. And she got out. Her father died. Her sister died. uh, And she uh, was a strong Christian, and she went around uh, the country, really all around the world, speaking And one day she was speaking, and I think it was in California, uh, and this guy came up to her after she talked, and she looked at his eyes, and she instantly knew this is one of the guards at the death camp who bothered me. And she looked at him, and he said, Corey, I don't know if you remember me. She goes, oh, yeah. (laughs) He said, I'm a Christian now. Mm. And the Lord really speaking to her heart, are you going to minister to him? Or are you going to hate him? And she's been around the country speaking about Christianity, speaking about forgiveness, speaking about holiness, speaking about truth. And the Lord pinpoints her and says, there's an issue of your heart that I still want to deal with. Here's this man, and you're mad at him. Are you going to forgive him? Or are you going to love him? Or are you going to hate him? Oh, And right there, she had to come with the Lord and say, I'm going to forgive him. It had to be God's strength to do that. And, oh, can we get through anything with God's help? Yes, yes, we can. We, we can't do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit to do it in us and through us. But it can be done. And God wants to do that. He, he wants us to change. He doesn't want us to stay the same. And there's a lot that needs to change. <laughs> I don't know about you, but the Lord shows me my heart. There's a lot in there I don't like. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you, you meant your own heart. <laughs> I thought you meant my heart. <laughs> uh, so he speaks to Hagar and says, Don't fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in your hand, 
in your strength, because the hand speaks of strength. Hold him in your strength, for I will make of him a great nation. Take a hold of him. Don't let him go. Don't don't give him up for dead. Take a hold of him, and, and let's go from here. Hold him in the strength that I'm going to give you to go through this time. I'm going to make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. <laughs> God bringing springs in the desert, huh? It, isn't that wonderful what God can do during our driest of times? He can bring a, a well of refreshment to you and I to strengthen us because water refreshes and water strengthens and gives us vigor again and, and gives us that, that way to go. And God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Uh, not, not the greatest of things, uh, but things that were necessary. You don't have to hold your place here, uh, but let's go to Galatians. Uh, and just take a, a look for a minute. Galatians chapter 4, if you would. Because here's the picture that's going on. Here's the picture of the things that we need to look at. And, and th- this, It sounds hard, but this is the reason why... Hey, it had to be, and it has to be for you and I. In verse 21, let's pick up there just for time's sake uh, and start there. Uh, it, the word says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Those that desire to be under the law, because Hagar and Ishmael are a representation of the law, Isaac a work of, of grace. And so that's the picture that you have to take with you as as you look at that. That's why putting all of Scripture together is so important. You just can't take one one verse and and take it out and do something with it. You have to take all of Scripture and put it together because otherwise it doesn't make a whole lot of sense sometimes. But God always makes sense and it's always perfect. For those of you that want to be under the law, don't, don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abram had two sons the one by the bondmaid and the other by the free woman. So Hagar and Sarah, here's the picture of these two moms with these two kids. But he who was of the of the bondwoman, uh, Ishmael, was born after the flesh. It was a work of the flesh. And it was a work of the flesh because remember in Genesis, when, when we had read it just a couple weeks ago, uh, that, that it said that Sarah thought that she couldn't have a child so she grabbed a hold of her, her uh, handmaiden, Hagar, and gave her to Abram and said, have a child with this woman because God has failed me. God isn't with me. God isn't given me birth, anybody to, to bear. Uh, and so it becomes a work of the flesh and not a work of the spirit. The work of the spirit would have been for Abraham and Sarah to trust the Lord in what he said that you're going to have a child and to wait for God to do it. And patience is one of your best virtues. I know. You're all the most patient people in the world. I'm here because I need patience. That's why he gave you to me or me to you. (laughs) Uh, Okay, maybe not. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was born by promise. He came by promise, promise from God, which things are an allegory. So here's the picture. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai under the law, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. And this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which is the place of freedom, which now is and in the bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So the picture there is Mount Sinai where the law was given, Jerusalem the place of freedom because Jesus came to Jerusalem, died there, set us free from the works of the law. Not so that we would be free of the law, but free to be able to serve it because of who he was. That we aren't saved by the law, we can only be saved by grace through faith. That's why we get the picture of Moses and Joshua. Moses could not bring the people of Israel into the land he was given the law he was the holder of the law he was the giver of the law and he couldn't go into the promised land because of the law the law can't bring you to heaven the law can point out to you your sin and your need for a savior but it can't bring you into the promised land 
only Joshua, our greater than Joshua, Jesus, can bring us into the promised land. And that's by grace through faith. It's not by the law. The law can't bring you in. It can show you. It can direct you. It can lead you. It can bring you to the place that's close so that you can see it, but you can't get in without Jesus. And there's only one name under heaven by which we must be saved, right? <laughs> the name of Jesus. Can't get through any other way. And, and so here's that picture. That's why Hagar and, and um, uh, Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac are so important, so important for pictures for us of what's really going on. And it says, for it is written in verse 27, Rejoice, rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which had a husband. <laughs> the law can only bring a little. The freedom of salvation can bring so much more. Abram has so many more children under the work of the Spirit than the work of the flesh. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. There we are. That word we there, put your name in there. That's us. <laughs> We're the we. <laughs> but, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him. And we saw that, didn't we? We saw Ishmael mocking Isaac and Sarah, persecuting him. That, that's what he was doing. That persecution wasn't just a, a mocking of sorts. It was a persecution that was come. Mm. Him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are the ones that are free in Christ. And if Christ has made us free, we're free indeed. Amen. That's what that whole picture is about. It, it isn't about God being a, a, a monster God who just comes to that place and says, Hey, I don't like this one. Get rid of it. It's a picture for us of what God doesn't like. God doesn't like the works of the flesh because the works of the flesh bring us into bondage and they, they hurt us. They, they never bring a sustaining grace to us. They never set us free. The law can't set you free. The law g just gives you limits on what you can do and what you can't do. Like that speed limit outside that says 35. And all of your cars don't go 35. There, there's no number that low on your speedometer. <laughs> 40, 40 is the lowest, I think. <laughs> it, it can show you what it is. It can bring you to a place of realizing what's going to happen if you break it, but it can't make you free. But God can make us free. And he's made us free today. So rejoice in that. We're going to take communion. We're going to uh, come to a place of remembering what God has done for us. We didn't finish this chapter, I know, but uh, we'll, we'll get there and we'll enter in the next time here. But uh, we're, we're in that place where... We really have to realize, am I still being kept under the law by something? Is there issues in my heart where I'm just kept by the law and I'm in bondage to it? Or, or is there a place where there's freedom in Christ? Do I know that place of freedom in Christ where I can be free? And so we, we, we just want to come this morning and just ask the Lord to show us the conditions of our hearts so that we can be set free from those things. And so, Father, uh, we come this morning. Uh, Lord, you know where we've come from. You knew where Hagar was. You knew where Ishmael was. You knew where Abraham was. You know where Sarah was. You know all the things that were going on. And you were able to minister in every way to each of those people, Lord. And we thank you for the picture, uh, Father, of just uh, the, the work of the flesh in the work of the Spirit. And we realize how important it is for, for us to walk in the Spirit. And for those of us that have a little bit of the Spirit, but we're mostly under bondage, Lord, help us to be set free this morning. Father, if there's issues that are there that you've touched in our lives and uh, we need to be set free, Father, please, may the work of your Spirit be evident in our lives this morning. R remind us, show us, Lord, so that we can be completely free in walking with you. Thank you for the freedom that you've given us in Christ, that we're no longer under the law, that we're set free. 
we're children of promise and we've been set free. And we're just so thankful that you've made us free, Lord. Help us to be free indeed, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.